I'm really excited to talk about some of the work that I've been doing with my students. Uh, I've been doing lots of work on real-time optimization and predictive control in the past in terms of speeding up optimization algorithms, and lots of you already talked about this topic, but I would like to introduce you to a slightly different topic more related to uncertainty. So how can we use machine learning model to build better uh, decision-making tools when we face uncertainty? And this is joint work with my graduate student, Irina, and my... Um, my graduate student Irina, my other student Cole Becker, sorry, I'm trying to make the clicker board. Okay, now it works. So Irina and Cole Becker, my students, and then my collaborator Barban Paris from MIT. So decision making under uncertainty, as you all know, appears in so many different areas. I mean, these are just a few of the ones where you could encounter uncertainty in transportation if you want to go from LA airport to here at different times of the day and different weather conditions, you might take a much different time. And also, when finance is one of these other scenarios where uncertainty really plays a big role in determining the price of the stocks across the days, and even energy, we saw this very nice talk before by Pascal, where lots of applications are affected by uncertainty. And uh, one of the sources of uncertainty is weather, so even going down to our day-to-day -day life, uh, most of you were expecting very sunny LA, now there's much more cold and, and rain, so this is also part of uncertainty affected all our everyday life. And uh, in the past, uncertainty was seen as this mostly through probabilistic models, but nowadays we're really lucky enough to have lots of data available that can help us making better decisions, okay? So the kind of problem that I would like to talk about today is a typical optimization problem where you have an objective function f and you have decision variables x that you want to minimize that could be continuous or discrete, and uh, we have an uncertain parameter u that affects our constraint. So some of you might be staring at this problem and saying, okay, this is not very well defined because, of course, given x, our constraints uh, g might be violated for different realizations of the uncertainty u. So in other words, uh, this problem needs to be modeled accurately in order to guarantee constraint satisfaction even when uh, unseen uncertain parameters get materialized. So what's one of the typical methods to deal with uncertainty is to build uncertainty set. And robust optimization is a very commonly used technique. It's tractable, it works very well, and it works as follows. You pick an uncertainty set where you um, assume that all your realizations live, and then you immunize against all the realizations of the uncertainty inside this set. So from the problem in the previous slide, you end up having a problem where the constraints need to be satisfied for every U that lives in this uncertainty set, right? And for many commonly used uncertain parameters, this is a very tractable way to model uncertainty. And uh, by the way, X, as I said before, could be integer, it's, I'm not describing exactly what kind of variable x is, but this is more generic than just continuous, and the uncertain parameter is every realization here. However, the, it's not very clear in many applications how to pick the uncertainty sets, and the whole point uh, behind robust optimization is choosing this uncertainty set in a smart way so that we are not too conservative, and, but we still guarantee constraint satisfaction. Okay, so what are the typical ways to uh, pick this uncertainty set? One very common way is to look at the support of the uncertainty. This is the worst case approach. For example, if you know that your demand is between a certain range, you don't allow different demands in your, let's say, order for an inventory management problem, your, you can just take the uncertainty set to be the maximum, the minimum value that this demand can take. This is very conservative, but it works. And uh, you don't take into account the probabilistic nature of the uncertainty. So more common approaches in robust optimization literature start by looking at the probability distribution describing the uncertainty. And then instead of taking a worst case approach, you, look, you build a set where, the, uh, where you try to capture a big part of the probability mass describing your uncertain parameters, right? You build a set where it's very likely that your parameters will fall into, and then you immunize against all the realizations of the uncertainty in this set so that you hope that, in practice, this translates into having a high probability of constraint satisfaction. 
The downside of this method is that nobody knows the true probability distribution, if there even is one. And also, even if you know it, these problems are still very hard to deal with. They're actually very intractable because you need to integrate the probability densities in multidimensional spaces. It's not de definitely very often not a convex problem. More recently, however, people started to look into data-driven approaches where by using the data of past realizations of the uncertainty, you want to build uncertainty set that work well. And uh, I just named a couple of papers here that try to build uh, data-driven uncertainty sets. I think there's many more, but I would say compared to the big literature available in robust optimization where most of the approaches are in this area, I would say this is still at the very beginnings in terms of how we can use data machine learning to build uncertainty sets and learn them in the proper way. So in this talk, I would like to use machine learning to build uh, uncertainty sets that are tractable, so we still want them, the resulting problems to be solved efficiently, but also they get their high performance. So we don't want too conservative uncertainty sets. And, and I will talk about two different techniques to do so. One is more related to machine learning clustering. Machine learning uh, clustering is, um, I, I will dive more into the details, but it's very commonly used in various applications of unsupervised learning. And then another approach is related to differentiable optimization where we can embed optimization uh, problems inside layers of computational graphs that could be neural network architectures or bi-level or multi-level optimization problems. Okay, and there were already lots of talks about this topic in this workshop, but I will uh, try to convince you that a robust optimization can really gain a lot by using data-driven approaches like these ones. And, yeah? Can I ask you <laughs> a Absolutely. question? So in the previous slide, right, you, yes. you distinguished the, between the data-driven and the probabilistic approaches. Yes. If I have data, I can try to predict the density function of you. That's a very good point, and actually that's, uh, we will do something along those lines in the next slide. So you can definitely try to infer the, uh, the density or the probability distribution, and there's lots of approaches that try to do so. So uh, here I'm referring to the ones that don't use data. That's, that's where I was referring to here, but of course you can use uh, uh, reasonings where you try to build estimates of the probability distribution using data. So I guess this category was to distinguish the data-driven approaches, whatever you use your data with, to the ones where you just assume that the distribution is Gaussian or uh, light-tailed or something uh, that is uh, unfortunately hard to verify in uh, some practical applications. But, and you're welcome. And feel free to interrupt me also for other questions. I'd like to uh, also discuss some of these ideas if you also because it's, uh, it might be touching different topics and would be good to generate discussions. Okay, so let's start from clustering. So um, this topic, before jumping into this topic, and actually it's related to the question, uh, I would like to intro introduce, for those of you who might have, have not already seen it, but I would say it's becoming very popular, is the concept of data-driven distributional robust optimization. Okay, this is one of the topics that gained lots of popularity recently and works using data, and it d actually builds some sort of uncertainty sets using data uh, in the following way. So we start from certain data points, and then we build empiri an empirical probability distribution using these data points, and then these approaches build an uncertainty set, or also called ambiguity sets, which is this ball here, where the center is the empirical probability distribution, and epsilon is the radius, and uh, you don't know the true probability distribution, but you assume that it lives in a set that is not too far, where it's not too far from the empirical probability distribution. And how do we measure not too far? We use this function W, which is the Wasserstein distance, and uh, P is the power that defines this distance. I'm not diving into the details of how this is described, but this is becoming super popular in the last period. It has lots of interesting connections with optimal transport, transport theory, and uh, it's actually a very elegant way to build uh, estimates of the probability distributions by just using data. So this approach is alternative to the uh, robust optimization approach because you start thinking in terms of probabilities. And let's try to compare the pros and the cons, at least in the context of this work. So robust optimization, also when you build 
uh, ideally, uncertainties that are also data-driven is very tractable because for many uh, convex functions or concave functions, you can derive robust counterparts very easily. And they're all tractable optimization problems. But it can be conservative depending on how you pick the uh, uncertainty set. Distribution and robust optimization, as I described before, can be less conservative because you estimate things by looking at the data-driven uh, uh, at the empirical distribution, but it can be computationally expensive, especially if you are integer decision variables. And um, so um, what I would like to do in this first part of the talk is try to marry the strengths of these two approaches. Yeah? So when, when you're talking about TRO here, because you have constraint in your problem, is it expectation in the constraint, or can it be something like chance constraints? Or so I will talk uh, for simplicity, like literally in probably the next slide or something like this in the about expectation constraints for now. But you can express also conditional value at risk in terms of expectations. So actually, this can capture more uh, upper bounds on the probability of constraint satisfaction. But for the moment, I'm looking for simplicity at expectations. Actually, I will clarify this in the next couple of slides. OK. so. What I would like to do is combine the best of these two, and I would like to use machine learning clustering as a tool to really bridge these two worlds. So let's start from answering the question. So the probabilistic guarantees that we want to ensure. So for now, for simplicity, but it can be extended to maximum of concave function. Now, I just have one concave function of u, and uh, it can depend in different ways on x. So not important how it depends on x, but on u is concave. But we don't know the true probability distribution, and we want to ensure that the expectation of this quantity needs to be less than or equal to zero. So what we do is that we plug in data, and uh, given a certain uh, draw of n samples, we, can, we want to build an optimization problem that gives you a solution, x at n, that is data-driven, so it's itself a random variable. So our probabilistic guarantees are of the following way. These are the typical finite sample probabilistic guarantees where we have the product distribution here over different draws of n samples. And uh, here we have the data-driven solution that you compute after plugging in this sample in your robust optimization model. And then we have this probability of constraint satisfaction 1 minus beta that is the one that you want to guarantee by building these formulations. OK, so this is the kind of probabilistic guarantees that we want to ensure. And it's very common. Yeah? The product is uh, over the data. So, so this yeah. is joint satis This is the, uh, the, a lower bound on the probability of satisfying uh, the constraint for all n data points simultaneously. So product, uh, actually, that, that's a good question. Product is in the sense that you have a distribution of the uncertain parameter. And then if you draw n times these uncertain parameter, you get the product distribution over this that describes how this data set evolves, is distributed. Yes? D is prior realizations. You could think about as a training set where you see realization of the uncertain parameter. It could be the demand across the past two years of an uncertain product, and you just know that uh, you have these realizations in the past, and this probability distribution is over this uncertain demand. So it's not a labeled data set. It's unlabeled. There's no X in it. Just basically, these are examples of what goes into U. Exactly, exactly. There's no X. No X. No, no. I'm not learning X. Other questions? OK, so this is a very standard way to ensure probability guarantees, especially if you don't know the distribution and you want data-driven approaches. And these are the ones that we will try to ensure in this first part of the talk. So now, the, what we will use is the concept of clustering, which is uh, if you have a certain set of data points, clustering just groups them in different groups. For example, here you have three groups, and it assigns cluster centers or mean, which are these d-bar points. Okay? So, and uh, this is very commonly used and taught in undergraduate classes all over the place, and there's many ways to do this step. And uh, the, all of them pretty much try to solve this problem where you want to minimize this function here, which is the sum over the clusters. The cluster k is the total number of clusters. And uh, you sum the distance between every point and the cluster that is assigned to that point. Okay? So you want to decide where the cluster centers are given a total number of clusters. You could use your favorite method. Here I'm not 
choosing one clustering method compared to the other, but at the end of the day, you will have a set of clusters that have centers, and you can judge how well you feed the points by using these centers, okay? So for example, you could use k-means. It scales very well. It might not be the best way to do it, but it's a way to cluster the points. Okay, so clustering has been used in uh, lots of topics related to robust or uncertain optimization. Also in sample average approximation, people have used clustering in many situations, but I would like to apply it to a slightly different problem here. So what's the kind of approach that we try to build here? So we want a data set and we want to, I will call it mean robust optimization, and I will tell you what it is in a second. So we apply clustering from a big data set, and then we have a smaller data set that depends on k cluster, and we want to build an uncertainty set that depends only on the cluster center. So in other words, in other words you're dramatically reducing the dimensionality of this data set. And then we want to solve this optimization problem, which has the same objective as before, but we have a slightly different constraint, a slightly different uncertainty set uh, as the ones that you've seen before, and I will guide you through what these are. So we have a constraint function now that is g bar, is not g, and uh, an uncertainty set that is defined around the cluster centers after you apply clustering, okay? It's called mean robust, and now it will become more clear why we chose this word, is that we are averaging both the constraints and the cluster, uh, the perturbations around the cluster centers. Okay, so now it seems super abstract, and I see all the offices trying to understand what, yes? Bartolome, so you're not restricting, you don't want it to be robust only for the cluster centers, right? I mean, you're restricting uh, the robustness, uh, uh, so the uncertainty set to the cluster centers only, or they are just a representative of uh, all the, 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 the uh, the uncertainty set. The uncertainty set is around the cluster center, so you can have perturbations around them. It's not only those realizations. It's not a, it's not in a, a finite set. Actually, it's a convex set. However, uh, you want to do it in a clever way because you want this is much smaller dimensional than other problems where you take all your data points together, but you want to still have probabilistic guarantees and uncertainty set that is tractable and uh, this kind of representations, but it's not only the cluster centers. No, otherwise, you're kind of overfitting. Yes? So you're doing the clustering to alleviate the computational costs. Exactly, exactly. This is why you're adding the cluster. Okay. That's, the main, that's the main idea, and we will see how, but we want to do it in a clever way and ensure that the constraint satisfaction is guaranteed. You are going to the details of that, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's still... <laughs> Means you're interested though, that's good. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. that the type of clustering method doesn't have any bearing on the downstream activities mm -hmm. that you're trying to do, but like if you are uh, signing like an isotropic kind of like uh, Gaussians so mm -hmm. during clustering, like then, or non isotropic, like let's say you're doing mixture of Gaussians or something like that, mm -hmm. then presumably in the uncertainty set you also want to respect that kind of a shape. Yeah, so actually we do that, and uh, the, uh, the clustering, it's not that it doesn't matter, it's, it's just that we just judge the objective function of the clustering procedure afterwards. So you can minimize that function however you want. Okay, but the clustering, of course, actually we will show that the bounds that we get depend on how well you're clustering. Okay. A very small oh, sorry. Yeah. Capital K is the number of clusters, not yes. one of the clusters. Number of clusters, yeah. Little k is, we identify one of the clusters. Okay, so let's describe this set more in detail. This is the uncertainty set we're talking about. So we are lifting the uncertain parameters in a higher dimensional space, which means that u now is not the uncertain parameter we had before, but this concatenation of v1 to vk, where v represent perturbations related to every cluster from 1 to k. And the uncertainty set is as follows. So is the sum of k, between one and k, which are the clusters, of wk is the cluster weights that tell you, of course, that if you put too many points in a cluster, you should weight it more compared to a cluster where you have just one point, and you penalize the distances between vk and d bar k, where d bar k is the cluster centers. And you choose your favorite norm, and this is raised to the power of p, which is the order, and actually this is exactly the same p as the Wasserstein uh, data-driven robust optimization uh, metric, okay? So that's the same P. So this thing is abstract, so let's 
describe three examples of what happens with this set. So if you have one cluster, very easy, you average everything together, you have one ball around the mean of the data points and the radius is epsilon. This doesn't depend on the power P. This is a very classical ellipsoidal uncertainty set in robust optimization. Okay, if you have n clusters, it means that you're not clustering actually anything. So you have a high dimensional uh, set and actually if P is equal to two, you can represent it as a ball where the center is the concatenation of all the data points. And this is in a high dimensional space where the radius is epsilon times the square root of n. This is exactly the set that corresponds to what you're doing with the Wasserstein data-driven robust optimization formulations. But you can see it as a robust uncertainty set. Okay, this is exactly what happens if P is equal to two with the Wasserstein distance. But then you can have all sorts of sets. For example, this one is very interesting. This is where where you have three clusters and P is equal to infinity. So the Wasserstein metric is with infinity. This means that the sum breaks apart into a maximum in a similar way as the one norm compared to the infinity norm, the sum of the absolute value becomes just the max. And uh, the uncertainty set is just these balls that are completely disjoint and the centers are the actual cluster centers and you're allowing perturbations around every one of your data points. In a, in a way that all of them need to be less than epsilon. So can, the nice thing about this set is that it can represent many things that we've already seen, and it can bridge the sets from robust optimization to data-driven distribution and robust optimization. So this is the uncertainty set, yes? Your, 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 essentially your uncertainty set is a set of vectors, right? One, one data point per, uh, per cluster, in a sense. Per cluster, yes, so it's higher dimensional. So you, Why do you do that? Because some cluster may have a lot more points than other ones, right? So you are gonna. So what? What are you gonna do with this vector? The weight. Yeah. The weight. <laughs> waiting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know that you're, you're you're waiting for the. But that's that's only you know finding the uh, where these points are located. But when you have these vectors, what are you gonna do with them? Right? Oh, now I'm gonna talk about it. Yes. So now I need to because, tell you. Because how... in a sense, what I'm saying there is that you are you are generating always for every one of the cluster. But one cluster may have many more things than another one. Yeah, and you're representing it with a W, the relative importance. Smaller, but still, you're, every one of these vectors will have one point from every one of the clusters, right? Yeah, so this V, you're lifting it one point per cluster, yes. It seems a lot, but actually you're reducing the dimension afterwards when you take the robust counterpart. Okay, so let me move on just to be sure to talk about everything I want to say. So the uncertain, uh, the, the robust optimization problem, the final one is, uh, where you lift the uncertain parameters into higher dimension, as I'm saying, and then you have this uncertainty set that I talked about in the previous slide, and the constraint is not G, but is G bar, where U is just, G bar is just the average weighted by how much every cluster matters, okay? So this is slightly different, and that's why you're taking the mean for the constraint across the clusters, okay? So why are we, are we doing this? So the reason is that these can encompass lots of different uncertain problems that we've already seen and that we know how to handle very well. So in other words, we average the constraint and we take this uncertainty set. And what happens is that when we want to solve it, we can do it by taking the dual. If you've already seen uh, these derivations in uh, uh, Wasserstein distribution and robust optimization, that's what happens. You take a dual which seems complicated, but it's actually the conjugate function of your minus the constraint function. This is where the cluster centers appear. And this is just, a, this phi is just a number that depends on the order, okay? So it's not particularly important. And this is the dual norm. So what I would like you to remember from this slide is that you have one constraint per cluster, which means that if you have n data points, this becomes n constraints, that if you, if you have a mixed integer problem where x is mixed integer, this becomes very hard to solve. And uh, if you have n cluster, this is exactly the dual, the, the robust counterpart of this Wasserstein distribution or robust optimization problem. However, if you have fewer clusters, you can uh, have a much lower dimensional problem. So in other words, by varying the number of clusters, this problem becomes much smaller dimensional. So the, the nice thing about this approach is that clustering allows you to bridge between distribution and robust optimization formulation and a typical robust optimization problem where you average everything together. 
So the idea is that by choosing the number of clusters, you can trade off computational complexity and conservatism if you do it in a smart way. Okay? So now I would like to talk about the probabilistic guarantees, just to go back to where we were. So we, it's actually relatively easy to ensure what we had before in terms of probabilistic guarantees, because if you have n samples, the standard approach to do it is to assume a light tail distribution and construct an uncertainty set where the radius depends on the probability of constraint satisfaction that you want to achieve and the number of samples. I'm hiding the expression, but you can construct it. It's, theoretic, it's a theoretical bound. And in terms of this n sample hyperdimensional ball, this, be, this is the same as having this epsilon here. So you can choose this epsilon, and theoretically, you can construct a ball that has these probabilistic guarantees. If you cluster the samples, we show that what happens is that you can just adjust the radius of this ball by adding this eta of n that depends on something very closely related to the objective function that you're minimizing in the clustering procedure. Okay? So if you cluster well, this eta becomes very small because this is exactly the distance that you have in the clustering procedure to the power of p. So if p is equal to 2, is the least squares no distance that you have in common clustering procedures. So the theoretical bound can be directly extended. And some of you who have worked with this bound already start thinking, OK, this is good, but actually they're very conservative bounds. And also there's this light tail distribution that we're assuming that is not always the case. So what we did is that we thought, OK, after proving this, we, we uh, looked into the constraint and we started to say, OK, can we understand what's the worst value of the constraint and try to relate it before and after clustering? And this is what we did here. So to bound the conservatism, we looked at this constraint where you have g bar and this uh, uncertainty set that we introduced. And then we looked at these two worst case values. One that is the maximum given an x of the constraint value given this uncertainty set, which is with n points, and the maximum when you have k clusters. Okay? And uh, what happens is that we, it's very, uh, the result is actually very elegant because we managed to show that if you have some uh, assumptions on the smoothness of the function minus g, which is a convex function of u, then you can bound these two numbers in this way. So the worst case value of the uncertainty, uh, of, of the uncertain constraint, is with k classes, it bounded between the one with n points and the one with n points plus l divided by 2, which is the smoothness constant, and d, which is the objective of the clustering procedure. So this result has some nice interpretation. One is that the better you cluster, the closer you are in terms of worst case value of the uncertain constraint. And also, the more linear the constraint is, and the, the smaller degradation you obtain. In other words, if L is equal to z zero, and your, this means that your constraint is affine in U, then clustering does not make any difference in what you're doing. So actually, the worst case value of the uncertain constraint before and after clustering doesn't make any difference, which means that actually you should cluster all the points together and have just one ball, the typical robust optimization ball. This is, you don't need to use many, many constraints if you have a linear function of the uncertainty. Okay? Which is actually very powerful because if you're solving a MIP, and uh, these are the, uh, this, the kind of probabilistic guarantees that you want to ensure, you just need to have one constraint. You don't need more of them. But if you have more, if you have a nonlinear function, you can bound depending on the curvature. So uh, maybe I'll just go quickly through this example where you have linear constraints. So if you have linear constraints, just to show you that you can recover the fact that it's equivalent to a robust optimization problem by taking the, uh, the convex the, the conjugate function of minus g, which is just a linear function and this equality constraint, and then realize that the, all the z variables that you introduce in the conjugate, they are the same, and then you obtain a convex reformulation where you have the following. So this is what I would like to, to focus on. If you have one linear constraint and p is equal to infinity, you obtain a constraint where you have this sum of the class, weighted cluster centers, which is actually the average of the data points, and uh, here you have the dual norm of p transpose x times epsilon. This sounds like the robust counterpart of a robust optimization problem. So if you have a linear constraint and the infinity uh, power of the Wasserstein distribution a robust problem, this is just the classical 
robust optimization problem. There's nothing more, and you shouldn't use more sample than just the average of all your data points. Okay? So now let me show you one example before jumping into the next topic. So this is a capital budgeting example. You have discrete variables, you have n different uh, projects, and you want to decide whether or not to start these projects. And you have an objective that you want to maximize that is a linear function of x, and is the a total net present value depending on the uncertainty u. This is a concave function of u. You have some budget constraints, and x is purely binary. Okay, so the net present value of this project is just uh, for project J, so the component J of this vector is just the sum across the time steps that you're considering of this concave function of U where you have the cash flow, the weighted uh, discounted cash flow where the discount appears in the denominator. That's why you get this nice concave function. So I wanted to show a concave function because a linear function, you don't get any difference at all of what's happening if you cluster more or less. So you can write it in terms of a robust constraint by writing this in epigraph form, turning into a minimization, and then you get a robust problem with this form, with g-bar, and the uncertainty set that we introduced. So let's compare now what happens. This is a conic mixed integer conic optimization problem, so we're solving it with mosaic. And what happens here is that if you have a relatively simple example with 120 data points, horizon of 5, and 20 um, 20 different projects. So on the left, I have the, so the, the x-axis is the number of clusters, and the y-axis here is the difference between the worst case value that the uncertain constraint takes and between k clusters and the version with n points. And you can see that the dash lines are the upper bound, so the upper bound works, and this is what happens if you increase the number of clusters. But what I would like you to focus on more is what happens here on the right. So this is a time comparison where you change the number of classes, and every curve is for a particular epsilon, which is the radius of this uncertainty set. And you can see that there's, as you can imagine, lots of speed ups in terms of computation time if you cluster more, because you greatly reduce the number of constraints that you're taking into account. However, what, what happens in terms of the objective? So in terms of the objective, then, and probability of constraint satisfaction, so this is the empirically computed one on the x-axis, and on the y-axis have the objective value of our problem. And this is the Pareto frontier by varying the radius of this uncertainty set. So if you have one cluster, this might not be super clear from the projector, but you have this blue line that stops here. So no matter how much you change epsilon, you, get, you can't get to the Pareto optimal point that is closer to zero, which is what you will, where you would like to be. You want low probability, of constraint satisfaction and low objective. However, if you start having two clusters, then you get this orange line, which is pretty much uh, overlapping with the function where you, have n, uh, where you have 60 or 120 clusters, which means you're not clustering at all. Which means that if you just look at two clusters, which is this much more performant uh, formulation, where you have just way fewer constraints, you get the same uh, uh, near optimal performance as when you have many, many data points and many, many constraints. So this, these results tell, tell us that when you have these data-driven approaches to solve robust optimization problems, you can, clustering makes a lot of difference. And in particular, with this approach, we can bridge the gap between robust and distributionally robust optimization. We quantify the clustering effect by seeing that if G is a fine in U, then there's no effect of clustering. We should just put all the points together and average them uh, together. And then if G is concave in U, then we build a performance bound that tell us how much worse the worst case value of the uncertain constraint becomes. And we got multiple orders of magnitude speed ups because we're, it's, uh, it was expected because we're just reducing the dimensionality of this problem a lot. And uh, I would like to have a shout out to my great student, Irina, because she won the Informs Computing Society Student Paper Award with this. So uh, she, the paper, if you're more interested, it's online and there's the experiments to reproduce all the results, also for other examples. Okay, and uh, the, the bottom line is that clustering really makes a difference. It's not a new idea to use clustering in robust optimization, but this is how to combine these two words that I found particularly exciting on their own. Okay, so now to jump in the second part of the talk before um, the end, I would like to mention something that is much more experimental. Actually, this is uh, still unpublished work, but I find it particularly exciting, and especially the context of this workshop, maybe some 
uh, something where we can talk about more uh, details of what could be done in this way, which is to embed differential optimization to solve these robust optimization problems. And to start, I would like to start from one example that is a typical news vendor problem. So this is the, uh, the problem where you want to minimize the order price that we want to minimize a certain objective that is defined by how much you're paying to order certain uh, newspapers. And uh, you also minimize minus the selling price, so you're maximizing the profits. And uh, you want to decide how many orders to make, but they depend on the uncertain demand, which in this case, we make it very simple. It's a log normal distribution, okay? And we want to do it in two dimensions to see what is going on here. And uh, we can write it as a robust optimization problem. Now forget the formulation we saw in the previous part of the talk. This is a simple robust optimization problem where you have this uncertainty set uh, U that depends on a radius epsilon. And this is our constraint function G, okay? So X in this case is the concatenation of Y, which are the orders, and tau, which is the, this new variable that you, we write to write it in epigraph form, okay? And the idea is that how do we pick the uncertainty set U? Right? There's many common ways, especially if you have data. So let's try to look at two examples to see how much better it can be. The typical one is the standard uncertainty set, where we take the data points and we just construct an ellipsoid around the mean, the empirical mean and the empirical covariance of the data points. Right? We do it, and we can also write it in this way, where we have the, norm, the two norm of A times U plus B, where A and B come from this empirical data. And there's a standard uncertainty set that people apply in practice. You try to capture the nature of your data points as much as possible. Now, I would like to show another uncertainty set here, which has the same form, where you have A, R, E, and B, R, E, that are the reshaped A and B, but it doesn't capture the data points so well. But, and I would like to uh, understand if picking the best shape and size of this robust optimization set can be done in a better way compared to the standard uncertainty set? And also, can the reshaped set be better than these ones that try to just follow the empirical distribution? And I would like to show you this example where we uh, compare the level curves of this function here. So we have an epsilon. We have the uncertain, the, this ellipsoidal uncertainty set given epsilon. We get the x star, which is the solution, and we plug it into the constraint function. And we want to plot the level curves of this constraint function by varying u. u is two-dimensional so that we can visualize them. So the standard uncertainty set, you can see that it tries to capture the data as much as possible. It's this red ellipsoid. And these level curves are, tell you the value of the uncertain function g. We want it to be less than zero. So of course, the robust solution will make it in that way that the level curves will touch the ellipsoid because we, we are solving a robust optimization problem. However, this reshaped set does not capture the data at all. Actually, it ignores the points that are far from this uh, level line that is equal to zero. And uh, we've tried with, very, with two values of epsilon for which it's slightly larger, but it's not even the mean of the data points, which is this red dot does not even fall inside this ellipsoid. However, so these two sets, if someone wanted to pick one of them, I would try to go with this one because it tries to capture the data more. However, if we plot what happens between the value of the objective and the probability of constraint satisfaction by varying epsilon, the bottom set is much better. You can achieve much lower objective and much lower probability of constraint satisfaction with these two sets. And I'm not doing anything magic. I just took these uh, two sets with two different values, and this one is just a different ellipsoid that is in a separate location, but it performs much better if you just vary the radius. So how can we find sets of this shape that perform as well? So it performs better, is that on a test set then? This is test set, yeah. This is unseen data, yeah. And these, are, these sets are uh, given A and B, they're fixed. It's not data-driven as in the previous part of the talk. So how do we pick it? And uh, the idea here is to define sets as parametric optimization problems, where u is a parameter that enters in the set. For example, this, um, and uh, remember, this is a maximum of concave function. It could be a bit more generic than in the first part. But again, we will consider simple functions like linear. For example, if you have a linear function and you have an ellipsoidal uncertainty set that looks like this, the parameters are a and b. 
Okay? So we want to represent the robust optimization problem as these parametric optimization problems where theta are the parameters. And I guess if you think about it, we would like to learn this theta. Okay? And how do we do it? We can represent the set like this. And if you write it in this way, we can write, and you have a linear constraint, for example, where the constraint is u transpose x less than zero, and you have this ellipsoidal set. The robust counterpart is a simple uh, reformulation where you have the dual norm here. The dual norm of the two norm is the two norm. And you have some other linear constraints. For every commonly used uncertainty set, you can always write the robust counterpart as another optimization problem that is parametrized by B and A. Okay, I could have used other norms, I could have used uh, other ways to parameterize the set, but in this way we picked A and B so that they can characterize completely the shape and the size of this set. But up to now we don't know how to pick them, so let's find a ways to use data to pick them. So we would like to first use probabilistic guarantees to guide us to pick them. Again, this is, um, in this part of the talk I would like to use uh, a posteriori guarantee. So we solve this inner problem given theta, we get a solution, and then we want to have probabilistic guarantees that tell us that given this solution, fixing this vector, we want the probabilistic guarantees to be satisfied so the probability of constraint satisfaction is high. If, you, if you're uh, uh, familiar with risk measure, this is the same as saying that the value at risk, given this x, is uh, less than or equal to zero because the value at risk is the smallest value of gamma which, for which the probability of being greater than gamma is smaller than eta. And uh, this object is very hard to quantify. Even if you know the distri probability distribution, this makes your problem much harder, and they're actually non-convex. So instead of doing that, we will use the conditional value at risk, which is the expectation when you violate the constraint or how much you're violating the constraints, okay? So you, you could have entire seminars on this topic, but I would say we use this because it's a nice expectation form that we can deal with. And uh, the nice implication is that if the conditional value at risk is negative, is non-positive, this implies that the value at risk is non-positive because it's an upper bound, you could show, and this implies that probabilistic guarantees are satisfied. So we will work with the CVAR, and we want to use data to represent the CVAR. So I will, um, I will do, this is a heuristic part again, this is still um, experimental work, but I would say that to describe the CVAR in our training procedure, we just do it in the following way. We turn it into a constraint of our training problem by instead of taking the infimum over alpha, we just keep alpha free, but we keep it as a constraint. And then we plug in data to describe the expectation in terms of your training data points. That's a constraint of our training problem. We want to make sure that this, is, this holds. And uh, we define this as a function h of the given x point, given theta, alpha, and eta. Eta is a parameter, and this is a condition of enforcing probability of constraint satisfaction. So what we did to train this uncertainty set is this procedure. So the training problem works as follows. This is what we saw to actually get the uncertainty set. It's an optimization problem over theta, which are the parameters of your uncertainty set. And uh, this is our uh, expression that tries to mimic what the CVAR is doing, and we want to make it equal to zero. So if the CVAR is equal to zero, this means that the probabilistic guarantee is satisfied. And uh, the inner part, which is where the differentiable optimization plays in, is that is a parametric robust optimization problem that depends on the uncertain parameters theta. So that's where we use differentiable optimization. Okay, so we use differentiable optimization to, uh, to represent this problem. And uh, so if you want to do it, we can actually, if you formulate a problem like this, we can actually solve it with augmented Lagrangian procedure because we want this function to be equal to zero. So in other words, we developed a, uh, we just applied traditional stochastic augmented Lagrangian procedures to enforce, to try to minimize the objective while enforcing that the constraint is satisfied. And the trick here is that the inner problem to compute the gradients is done by using differentiable optimization and differentiating through the optimality conditions of the inner problem, okay? Which is what, uh, what we've been seeing in lots of talks in this workshop. And then we have these uh, variable updates. This is standard augmented Lagrangian methods. So it's nothing uh, uh, more involved than that. The only trick is that we're using an inner optimization problem, which is the robust one that we're solving over X. So just to going back to the 
news vendor problem, you could see that our training procedure is able to go from the standard uncertainty set, and we actually recover the uncertainty set that I showed you at the beginning by just reshaping A and B and tuning them by enforcing this, uh, this constraint and uh, using a first order method. And maybe in the last few minutes, I would like to talk about another slightly more complicated example, which is an inventory management problem, where this is a two-stage problem where we want to define, we have this, we want to minimize the transportation and holding cost depending on our stocking decisions. And uh, we have some also sales price R. And uh, after an uncertain parameter U is realized, we want to apply some sales decision. So this is a two-stage problem. And the sales decisions need to be bound by how big is the stock level at this after, uh, after we apply the stocking decisions and by the demand, which is an affine function of some market factors that are represented by the uncertain parameter. It's not important to see the details of this. This is a, an example from this nice paper by Dan and Nikos. The, uh, the important thing is that it's a two-stage adjustable optimization problem where you, we use linear decision rules to bring it into standard robust optimization problem. And we want to learn the uncertainty set for this. So if we apply the procedure that I talked about, then we, we saw this very interesting behavior over training. So this is the target level of the CVAR constraint. And this is the in-sample CVAR and the out-of-sample CVAR. We just see the in-sample one during training. And you can see that it, uh, you try to make it equal to zero using the training procedure. And the objective first goes down a lot, but then you see that it will be unfeasible for the CVAR. So by adjusting the parameters of this augmented Lagrangian method, we recover the, value of the, object, the minimum value of the objective while satisfying the constraints. And interestingly, if we take this reshape set and we vary the size afterwards, we could represent a nice Pareto frontier where we compare on the top plot the empirical conditional value at risk out of sample and the objective value, and in the bottom plot the probability of constraint satisfaction and the objective value. And you can see that, for example, by just varying epsilon, which means inflating and deflating the set with the same shape, we can get, for example, in this case, a 5% reduction of probability of constraint satisfaction for the same objective. This is just a simple example. I believe you can construct way more things that are interesting in this realm, but I would say it's a very elegant procedure to choose the uncertainty set in traditional robust optimization problems using data. So again, we found a way to optimize the shape and the size of these uncertainty sets at the same time. And we use a bi-level formulation where the empirical CVAR is represent, approximated as a constraint. And then we use differentiable optimization layers to compute the gradients of the, uh, of the solution of the inner robust problem with respect to the parameter of the uncertainty set. Unfortunately, we don't have the paper yet, but I would like you to follow the, my website and Twitter because I will post it relatively soon. And we're also building a nice software package to also model these problems very easily. So I would like to conclude briefly by thanking my co-authors, my students, Irina and Cole, and my collaborator, Barvan Paris. And uh, I would like to leave you with uh, just some food for thought regarding robust optimization. So I think machine learning can help us not only speed up decisions, but also uh, really build better robust optimization problem models. And these robust optimization problems are also a way to start to rethink the way that we go about robust optimization. Instead of being a set that we construct offline based on assumptions on the probability distribution, it should be, in my opinion, something that is more of a training and validation procedure where we can apply all these nice, modernly available machine learning tools to do better. And all these tools will combine data and optimization in algorithms that, do, that can improve the way that we make decisions. With that, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions.